I'm a surgeon uh, here in the Denver area specializing in, uh, among other things, surgery for epilepsy. And I've uh, talked in this forum about some of the stuff that I do before. Um, I wanted to focus this evening on one of the newer procedures that we have, uh, at least for epilepsy, something called deep brain stimulation. Um, and so uh, you already touched on this, Wendy, but uh, right now I'm a neurosurgeon uh, doing my cases primarily at Swedish Medical Center, but I do all of the stuff that we'll be discussing tonight. Uh, I'll make a quick plug for my website, which um, if I go through things too quickly in this talk, you'll have a chance to kind of uh, look at some of these treatments um, in a little more detail, look at some photographs of the cases themselves. Uh, and, and I think it's a good tool and I can vouch for the content because I, I made it myself. Uh, I'll put this up again at the end. Um, but this evening I wanted to start just by giving kind of a general background on epilepsy um, and then shift a little bit more into what a surgical evaluation is. So who do we think about surgery for? Uh, why do we think about doing surgery? What are the pieces that go into that evaluation? Um, and what are the surgical options? And then we're gonna spend uh, much of the talk uh, later on talking about one of the particular therapies that we have, uh, as I mentioned, called deep brain stimulation. Uh, so just to start on background, um, this is probably familiar to many of you, but um, epilepsy is very common. We think, you know, something like one to 2% of all people in the world. And uh, at any given time, about a third of those patients, so 30 to 40% have seizures that we can't get under control with medications alone. And uh, we refer to these patients as having seizures that are drug resistant or medically refractory. Uh, and we know from decades of studying patients with uh, drug refractory epilepsy that the chance of achieving our goal, which is seizure freedom, meaning uh, completely free of seizures, uh, just by adding a new medication is fairly low. And that has persisted despite decades of drug development. Um, looking at that percentage of patients uh, who've been medically refractory and added new medications. Unfortunately, despite new drugs that we've seen over the past, say, 30 years, this number has still hovered, you know, in the mid 30s. And traditionally, it's been this population of patients that we think about for surgery. Um, we think about surgery because we know that having untreated seizures can have a variety of effects on a person's health and a person's psychosocial well-being. So continuing to have seizures can, can pose a variety of problems. So difficulty maintaining a job, um, changes in cognition or memory or quality of life. Uh, and then of course, the very scary thing we worry about in uncontrolled epilepsy, which is the risk of sudden death or pseudo. Uh, so a very strong mandate to take care of patients with, with drug resistant epilepsy. Um, but a question I commonly get is, well, who should we evaluate for surgery? When should we just think about surgery? Um, and I think the answer to that is pretty broad. So uh, I would uh, propose, and uh, you know, this is generally what we do in neurosurgery, is anyone who's having seizures that have not been controlled after trials of two or three medicines um, should at least have an evaluation for surgery. And when you think about it, this is a pretty broad mandate. And the number one problem that I, I face as an epilepsy surgeon is that most patients who would be candidates for surgery that could really change their quality of life never meet somebody like me. They never learn that surgery is an option for them. And that's what we're trying to change with uh, webinars like, like today's. Um, quickly, some of the benefits of epilepsy surgery. So of course, there's, there are some cases in which surgery can be curative, meaning that we can render a patient seizure free. Um, sometimes we can't, but even when surgery is not curative, it can improve quality of life. Um, the technology that we have today is better than it ever has been in the past. And so the procedures that we'll, we'll discuss today are less invasive than we had even just a few years ago. Uh, and I think the message to take away from this evening is that patients today have options and it's important really to understand what they are and then to choose the treatment that makes the most sense for the patient and his or her family. Um, so what is a surgical evaluation? When somebody's referred to me or uh, when a neurologist is considering referring a patient to a surgeon, what goes into that workup? 
Um, the general idea is that in an epilepsy surgery workup, we're trying to understand is there a part of the brain that's causing seizures? I think of seizures kind of like a wildfire. So uh, they start in a part of the brain uh, and then they spread. And in trying to prevent the next fire, what we're most interested in is can we hone down on where those fires are tending to start? Um, the next question once we figure that out is determining whether the tissue that we've identified in the brain that's causing the seizures is important for normal function. So things like speech or vision or language uh, or, or movement, things that we don't want to disrupt. Now, depending on those two, we either decide to treat the seizures by removing or damaging the tissue that we think is responsible or by using another set of therapies that I'll refer to as neuromodulation to try to change the electrical activity in the brain to try to reduce the number of seizures. An important distinction to draw is um, uh, the one between focal and generalized epilepsy. Um, so focal epilepsy means that there's a part of the brain or perhaps several parts of the brain that for whatever reason are damaged or diseased are prone to causing seizures. So the seizures tend to start in that spot or one of those spots and then spread to the rest of the brain from there. Generalized epilepsy is very different, and it means that the whole brain is somehow susceptible to seizures. So seizures can really start anywhere, and they rapidly uh, spread to the entire brain. Um, importantly, most adults, not all adults, but most adults have focal epilepsy, the first kind, and that most of the surgical tools that we have, uh, including deep brain stimulation, are for focal epilepsy. Uh, so this is kind of general diagram of our algorithm. When I meet a patient that has uh, focal drug re resistant epilepsy, the first question I ask is, have we identified that particular part of the brain that is causing the seizures? Do we, do we have the seizures localized, as we say? Um, how do we do that? Well, we have a variety of tools. One of them is very simply just the symptoms that a patient has when she has seizures. Seizures that start with tingling, for example, or visual phenomenon, those things give us clues as to where in the brain they're starting. So the very uh, symptoms at the start of a seizure or a seizure aura can be very telling to us as to where, where the seizure is beginning. Uh, we next use other clues, so a video EEG or sometimes called long-term monitoring. This is when uh, scalp electrodes are connected and we watch a patient with a video camera to try to understand what we're seeing and correlate that with electrical signals in the brain. Uh, we use a brain MRI, so a picture of the brain that shows uh, three-dimensional anatomic detail to look for clues. Maybe there's a part of the brain that looks uh, diseased or uh, there's a growth, anything that might give us a clue to, to something being off. Um, a PET scan, so this is a scan that looks at brain metabolism, uh, and usually the part of the brain that's causing seizures will show a reduced metabolism. Um, and then finally, neuropsychological testing. This is detailed uh, pencil and paper testing that looks for cognitive strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes we can see patients who have a pattern of strengths or weaknesses that suggest a particular part of the brain is involved. Um, so each of these gives us a clue. And sometimes we have a very nice situation where all of these clues line up and point to a single source. But in many cases, we end up in this situation, which is where one of the tests may suggest one part of the brain and others implicate other areas. Uh, and so in cases like this, we may recommend additional testing to try to hone in on, on where the seizures are coming from. Part of the reason uh, for the imprecision in some of those uh, tests is very simply this, that when we use scalp electrodes, which I've shown as these little blue discs on the skin, sometimes they're very far away from where seizures are beginning. So this is, for example, uh, a seizure onset in the hippocampus. And you can imagine that as electrical signals travel from the hippocampus through the rest of the brain, through the spinal fluid, the skull, and the skin, that you can lose a little bit of information about where those seizures are beginning. And so sometimes when we don't have enough information to be precise about a seizure onset, we might recommend something called phase two monitoring. Uh, this is very similar to uh, video EEG where the electrodes are on the skin, but this time we put them on, uh, on the surface of the brain or inside it instead of on the skin. We have different ways of doing this. So this is one called frame and ovale electrodes that uh, 
we're, we're using less and less. Uh, more commonly, we use something called cortical grids or strips. Uh, this is basically a piece of silicone that sits on the surface of the brain in the part of the brain that we're suspicious where the seizures are starting. Uh, and we can record from the surface of the brain. But increasingly, I use a procedure called stereotactic EEG or SEEG. Um, this is a procedure where we insert tiny electrodes actually through the skin itself and into the brain. Um, it's planned on a 3D uh, software platform, and then we insert them uh, using a robot for, for guidance. So um, all of those are tools that help us get more, more accurate or millimeter level uh, information about where seizures are starting. And once we have that information, the next question we ask is, well, is the part of the brain that's causing the seizures, as we say, resectable? Uh, now, what does resectable mean? Uh, generally, I take it to mean two things. The first of which is that there's only one part of the brain that's responsible for the seizures. If there's not several parts that are scattered around. Uh, and number two, the part that we've identified, as I mentioned before, is not essential for things that we don't want to disrupt. So things like movement, speech, vision, or memory. If we find that epileptic tissue that's causing seizures is resectable, um, the main two options we have are removal by craniotomy, uh, which means opening the skull up to remove some of the damaged tissue, and a newer treatment that I use increasingly called laser interstitial thermal therapy, or uh, laser ablation for short. Um, removal of tissue is something we've been doing for a long time. One of the most common uh, ways uh, or common forms that it takes really is something called a temporal lobectomy. Uh, that's because many adults uh, who have focal seizures have seizures that arise in the temporal lobe. And this is a procedure where we open uh, part of the skull here on the temple and remove the front part of the temporal lobe. I've shown some images over here from a CAT scan of a patient I did this on recently. Um, We've discovered that there can be advantages to avoiding larger openings in the skull, uh, in particular when the area responsible for seizures we think is relatively small. And increasingly, I'm using this, this therapy called laser interstitial thermal therapy. Um, and, and what this is, is, is basically a technology that allows us to introduce a tiny laser catheter deep into the brain uh, and using an MRI for guidance to burn some of that tissue. So this is an example case where you can see me burning um, the hippocampus in a patient with hippocampal epilepsy. So the orange represents tissue that we have ablated with the laser. And we do this in an MRI scanner. And when we've ablated enough of the tissue, we take out the probe and close it with a single stitch. So it's a very nice technology. And it's largely emerged as an alternative to a temporal lobectomy. Um, so, what if we find that the seizures that are happening are not resectable? So, what if, for example, there's more than one spot in the brain or the spot in the brain that's responsible we think is essential for functions that we don't want to disrupt? Um, in that case, we use a category of therapies that we refer to as neuromodulation. Uh, neuromodulation, very simply, uh, in, in 2021 means that we're applying electrical pulses or electrical stimulation to part of the nervous system in an effort to change neural activity. Um, a few things about neuromodulation, it's rarely a cure for epilepsy. It's, it's seldom that we have patients that become uh, completely seizure-free, but most patients who have one of these therapies that we'll discuss see very significant reductions in the number of seizures that they have, and they also enjoy other benefits. So patients uh, who have these kinds of therapies report a better quality of life. Often they have better cognitive outcomes, meaning better thinking and memory uh, than if we had removed or damaged part of the brain. And importantly, uh, all of these therapies have been shown to reduce the risk of SUDEP or sudden death from epilepsy. Uh, and importantly, because these therapies don't destroy brain tissue, uh, they're flexible, uh, they're reversible, we can take them out, we can turn them up, we can turn them down. And the best data we have, the best uh, clinical studies suggest that the longer patients have these, the more effective they are. Um, so in, in 2021, we have three uh, forms of neuromodulation that are in use. Uh, 
Um, the one we've had the longest is something called vagus nerve stimulation. Uh, there's another therapy called responsive neurostimulation. So vagus nerve stimulation applies the electrical current to the vagus nerve in the neck, which is connected to the brain. Responsive neurostimulation, or RNS, applies the electrical stimulation to part of the brain. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have deep brain stimulation. And this is the newest therapy we have for epilepsy. And that's what I wanted to focus on for the remainder of the talk. Uh, importantly, DBS is not a new therapy by any means. We've had it for uh, 20 to 25 years for other neurologic disorders, things like Parkinson's disease and, and essential tremor. But it's only been recently we've discovered that it can actually uh, provide quite a bit of benefit to patients with epilepsy. This is a little video diagram I made kind of showing what the electrodes look like. So um, like RNS, DBS applies the electricity to part of the brain, uh, but it applies it to a particular part of the brain called the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. Um, we think of DBS uh, kind of like a pacemaker for the brain. So um, it's a system that has a battery that we implant under the collarbone, under the skin, um, and a set of wires that travel under the skin up, up to the head and then go into the brain uh, and deliver very targeted pulses of electricity that a patient can't really feel from the outside, uh, but have the effect of reducing seizures over time. Um, we target, again, a part of the brain in the thalamus, which is this little egg-shaped structure in the center of the brain that we know is important in a circuit uh, that causes seizures in a number of patients. Uh, one of the nice features about DBS is that we don't really need to understand where the seizures begin with millimeter accuracy. So sometimes that means we don't have to do the phase two monitoring that I mentioned earlier. Uh, DBS seems to work for focal seizures regardless of where they start in the brain. Uh, this is what the hardware looks like. So again, a couple of probes that enter through the top of the head. The wires travel under the skin, actually behind the ear. And this is the battery that we implant uh, just beneath the collarbone. Uh, and the wires themselves, I'll point out, are incredibly thin, uh, something like a millimeter wide. Uh, I often compare them to kind of the, the tip of my pen as being about half as thick as the tip of my pen. Um, and this is the target. So uh, we call it the ANT for short, or the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. Um, it's a part of this egg-shaped structure that we have in the center of the brain. We have two of them, one on either side. And we know that it's connected to a variety of structures uh, in the temporal lobe and in uh, something called the limbic system that we know are commonly involved in, in patients with seizures. Um, we can think of the thalamus kind of like a relay station in the brain. So it, it, it is... Um, kind of like a telephone operator who connects one part of the brain to another. So uh, there's a lot of wiring that runs through the thalamus, and that's why we think that it's effective at uh, modulating or affecting seizures pretty much no matter where they originate in the brain. Here are just some more detailed uh, diagrams that, that show the things that we're looking for on these MRIs when we do the targeting. This is the ANT or anterior nucleus of the thalamus when viewed from the side. This little star here, uh, or the red dot uh, on this other diagram, is the surgical target where we aim to place the electrode in the brain. Uh, just another uh, schematic diagram kind of, kind of showing the same thing and, and showing how the ANT is connected to some of these other structures that are familiar to us that are often involved in epilepsy. So the amygdala and the hippocampus, two of these structures in part of the temporal lobe. Uh, now, as I mentioned, with all forms of neuromodulation, uh, we see that seizure control seems to get better over time the longer patients have this therapy. So this is from the pivotal clinical trial that led to the approval of DBS in the United States. Uh, it followed patients uh, up to seven years, and what we saw is that year over year, these patients seem to report better and better control of their seizures. So at the end of the first year, <clears throat> excuse me, the average patient was seeing something like a 40 or 44% reduction in their seizures. Uh, 
out at year seven, the average patient was seeing their seizures reduced by something like 75% or three quarters. Um, so not a complete cure, but for most patients, seeing a 75% reduction in seizures is, is very meaningful. Uh, and this is what's called the responder rate. So this is the percentage of patients that are seeing at least a 50% reduction in seizures. And you can see out by year seven that, uh, again, almost three quarters of patients are seeing at least a 50% reduction. And this compares very favorably to, to some of the other forms of neuromodulation that we discussed earlier. Um, as I mentioned, with, with neuromodulation, there's benefits beyond just the number of seizures that patients are having. Uh, we have studies that suggest that DBS reduces the severity of seizures, so patients report that their seizures are not quite as severe or as long, and that also these patients report that their quality of life is improved with, with DBS, independent of how much their seizures are reduced. Um, and we have an, another study uh, down here at the bottom that shows that Patients who have DBS report fewer injuries from their seizures. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned, a lower risk of sudden death or pseudo. We also have data that uh, patients who have DBS over time see improvements in their cognitive performance, or at least a prevention of worsening of their cognitive performance. Uh, you can see uh, these are comparisons of um, different cognitive metrics across the spectrum uh, versus baseline, you can see that most of these dots fall on the right side of these lines as opposed to the, the left side of these lines, meaning that patients are reporting improvement. Um, and then seizure freedom. So as I mentioned, when I think about DBS for patients, um, I don't really think about it as something that's, that, that I promise patients will give them seizure freedom. But nonetheless, we do find that there are a number of patients that have significant intervals where they're completely free of seizures. Um, in the big clinical trial that I mentioned, uh, around 18% of patients reported that they had at least one six-month interval where they were completely seizure-free, and close to 10% of patients reported that they had an interval that was at least two years long where they were seizure-free. So again, seizure freedom isn't something that I promise patients when we think about this surgery, but a certain percentage of patients do experience it at least for some time. So I wanted to spend a little time and walk through what the process of having DBS for epilepsy looks like from a patient's standpoint. Uh, what are the individual steps involved and, and, and what are those like? Um, so the first thing, of course, is, is just securing a diagnosis of epilepsy. Um, if you're on uh, this webinar, chances are, and you're a patient, chances are that's something that uh, has already happened. Um, and really the next thing, I look for is a failure of medications. And this is not to say that medications don't help or don't work at all, but really that despite, uh, again, trials of two or three or more medicines, uh, that patients are still continuing to have regular seizures that they feel interfere with their, their daily life. Um, and in an ideal world, a failure of medications, as, as we discussed, should trigger a patient getting a surgery evaluation and meeting somebody like me. And as we discussed, a surgery evaluation means a few things. It generally means a video EEG where we try to capture some of those seizures on camera with electrodes uh, on the skin. Uh, some brain imaging, including an MRI and a PET scan. Uh, a psychology evaluation. And then, and then at some point in that process, meeting with a surgeon, meeting with someone like me. Um, patients commonly ask me, you know, why do I need to meet with a psychologist. Um, as we talked about, sometimes the psychology evaluation can actually give us clues as to where seizures are starting. Um, but other times we use that evaluation to help us decide on which surgery we think is ideally suited for a patient, which one is the safest. Uh, and that's very simply because as, as you all recognize, epilepsy can cause problems with, with language, with memory, with other cognitive functions. And certain kinds of surgery can make some of those cognitive weaknesses worse. And so screening patients, uh, number one, it helps us choose the right patients to have surgery. Uh, once we've chosen the right patients, it helps us select the safest uh, surgery for each patient. And it helps us uh, minimize the risk of cognitive problems after surgery. Doesn't help me if, if I'm able uh, 
uh, to completely rid a patient of their seizures if we've affected them in a way that, that is otherwise detrimental to their life. Um, and so next comes surgery. And in the case of DBS, um, generally we do surgery in two different steps. Um, the first step, which we sometimes call stage one, is the bigger of the two surgeries, and that's where we implant the wires in the brain. There's one wire that we implant in either side of the brain from the top of the head. Uh, this generally involves staying in the hospital for one night, uh, being able to go home the following morning. And then usually a week or two later, I bring the patient back for a smaller procedure that's an outpatient procedure, meaning you can go home the same day where we put the battery under the skin, uh, again, in the upper chest underneath the collarbone. Um, this is a pretty quick surgery and, and, as I mentioned, doesn't involve any stay in the hospital. Um, what does surgery look like? I took a few uh, pictures to just kind of break this down. Um, these are from the surgical planning that I do um, to help place the electrodes. I create a 3D model using a patient's MRI and CAT scan and use this to plot where I'd like to place the electrodes. Um, so this is me doing the targeting. This is uh, the anterior nucleus of the thalamus on one side over here. And here's me planning where I want my electrode to land. Uh, this is a little bit of what the surgery looks like. Um, I have the patient, um, uh, this is the patient's head right here inside of a CAT scanner that we can use to check uh, where the electrode uh, is. And I use a surgical robot that really helps me align uh, where, where I'm placing the electrode with millimeter precision. Um, I think some common misconceptions are that the surgery is uh, performed by a robot, and that's uh, not at all the case. But I think it's a nice tool that makes uh, surgery a little bit safer, uh, more efficient, and more accurate. And so I've moved to using it almost exclusively in my, in my DBS practice. Um, and then, as I mentioned, a week or two after that first surgery, the patient comes back, and I make a small incision uh, right beneath the collarbone to place the battery. Um, we hook uh, a wire up that travels under the skin from the brain wire all the way down to the chest. And then a couple of weeks later in the neurologist's office, the whole system is turned on. Common question I get uh, about DBS surgery as well, uh, what, are, what are the risks? The main risks that I cite to patients are uh, infection, uh, about 1% to 2%, uh, that the therapy doesn't meet expectations. So that's why I try to be very clear with patients uh, beforehand about what to expect. Um, as I mentioned, the average patient long-term sees about a 75% reduction in seizures. But some patients are much better than that, and some patients are below that. Um, I, I cite risks of memory or mood changes. Uh, there have been some clinical studies that suggest a small percentage of patients feel some of these, but they, they don't bear out on the cognitive testing that I showed you earlier. Um, and then bleeding in the brain uh, uh, risk is about 1%. Most of the time when bleeding happens, it's not symptomatic at all. A patient doesn't have any problems, but we can see it on a CAT scan. Uh, but in rare circumstances, it, it can cause symptoms. Um, so in terms of post-op care, um, the device is turned on in the neurologist's office, usually a few weeks after it's first put in. Um, and then we slowly ramp up the therapy over several weeks so that we make sure that patients are tolerating it and not having any side effects. Um, after we reach the final level where we want to leave the stimulation, Patients have routine visits to their neurologist to check in just to make sure that everything is going well. Um, and then every few years, and, and I should emphasize few, I, I mean really probably five plus years uh, on average, patients may need to come in to have the battery replaced. Or for patients who are interested, you can actually have a charger that allows you to charge it at home. Uh, some advantages of DBS over uh, some of the other therapies that we discussed earlier. I've kind of touched on these already. Uh, but to do DBS, we're not required to do the invasive monitoring where we put the electrodes in the brain to study the seizures. Um, for patients who really don't want to have procedures where a battery is replaced, whether it's up here or in the chest, we do have rechargeable batteries. Uh, and unlike the RNS system, for example, Patients don't need to upload their data every few days to the cloud to let their neurologist see it. Um, just a little bit about some advances we've had recently in terms of DBS technology. 
Uh, we now have uh, a product that allows us actually to listen to the brain, to look at the electrical signals in the brain and correlate them with the patient's seizures to try to understand signals that we think are indicative of oncoming seizures and help us tailor therapy to, to optimize it, individualize it for patients. Um, this is a new product that we've just started implanting over the past few months that, that allows us to do that. Um, and, and so I think the last thing I want to leave you uh, with is this, that um, if you looked at how we treated epilepsy with surgery, even just 10 years ago in 2011, we actually had very few options for patients. Um, today, we have more options, not only in terms of diagnostic uh, uh, tools, but also the, the therapeutic or the treatment procedures that we can offer. And so my messages uh, to conclude here are, are very, very simple. Um, we've seen promising advances in surgery for epilepsy over the past 10 years, which means that today doctors like myself uh, have more flexibility and importantly, patients have more options. Um, deep brain stimulation is a therapy we've had for a long time uh, for other neurologic disorders uh, but we now know for epilepsy is both safe and effective and has benefits that include reducing the number of seizures that patients have, reducing the severity of those seizures, reducing the risk of sudden death, and improving quality of life. Uh, so once more, this is, this is the link to my website, and, and maybe Wendy can distribute it uh, after the talk is done. Um, I have pages there on epilepsy uh, that, that go into um, more detail about some of the things we discussed today, uh, a page about deep brain stimulation. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll conclude. Um, if anybody has interest in, um, in meeting me and learning more about this, if, if um, you think that you or a family member might be a candidate, uh, there's a few different ways to get in touch with me. There's a way to submit referrals on my website um, if you have a neurologist or another doctor who'd like to send a referral, we can accept them by fax or uh, by email. This is my medical assistance email down here. But um, I'll wrap up and, uh, and, and importantly, shut up. And uh, hopefully there's some questions that I'd be happy to address.